All right, well, thank you uh, for having me. Um, let me tell you a bit about myself um, before I get started. Uh, I grew up in Punta Gorda. Um, and for those of you who don't know where that is, that's in between uh, south of Tampa, about 100 miles on the Peace River, where the Peace River comes out to Charlotte Harbor in the Gulf. Uh, it's a little town that was founded uh, in the late, was platted in the late 1870s, um, became a town uh, in, I believe, 1881. So I grew up in a 110-year-old house, a Victorian house on brick streets. Um, you know, we had a 100-year-old courthouse. My high school is on the historic register. Uh, it was an old town for South Florida, for Southwest and Southern Florida. Um, it was fairly unique because all around me were these big 50s era land giant, so-called land giant developments, including, uh, let me see, including uh, Port Charlotte, Northport, Rotunda, Cape Coral, Golden Gate. Uh, and I was always interested in these communities, these mid-century modern uh, communities that were built not just in Southwest Florida, but all over Florida during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And I always found these places to be kind of weird. Um, and why? Uh, well, <laughs> let me tell you a, a, again about Port Charlotte. What was it like? This is a quote about Port St. Lucie. For those of you who've been to Port St. Lucie, this was from the 1980s. Uh, the Mets uh, moved to Port St. Lucie from St. Petersburg. And in the 80s, if some of you remember and were baseball fans, the Mets were the best team in baseball. This is the mid 80s. They had all the best players and they would always get in trouble. And so all the news reporters would follow them around like they were the Chicago Bulls. Uh, and they moved to Port St. Lucie, which was a big giant collection at the time of single family homes and tens of thousands of home sites with no downtown, uh, no sidewalks, not very many parks, uh, just single family homes, 80 by 125 foot lots, probably 120,000 times. Uh, and so these Manhattan based writers would come down and, and look around and wonder, where am I? I'm spending six weeks in Florida, but I'm not on the Gulf, I'm not in St. Pete. I'm certainly not on, on the East Coast that I remember, you know, Miami or Lauderdale or, or Boca. You know, this is a different place. This is somewhere out of the 1950s. It looks like a suburb. And, and so I, I caught this quote in the New York Times that they described Port St. Lucie as the quintessence of suburban sprawl with no city to sprawl from. And so growing up in Punta Gorda, uh, when I had a little town, Right across the water from me was Port Charlotte. And Port Charlotte really forms uh, an, an important piece in the history of modern Florida. And you would never think that driving through it. I never knew that living in Punta Gorda. I always hated Port Charlotte. It was a rival. But it didn't have a downtown. It didn't have sidewalks. Um, for the first 10 years of its existence, it didn't have schools. It simply had 100, almost 200,000, 80 by 125 foot lots. And so I wanted to know why that was. And then I realized that there were other Port Charlottes, there were Port St. Lucie's and Cape Corals and Golden Gates and Rotundas and Spring Hills and Deltonas and Palm Coast. And that these communities formed what, what I call the great Florida exurbs. You know, these aren't suburbs. Uh, these aren't cities as much as they're freestanding um, communities, freestanding communities. And they were all built the same they all come from the same era in which large Miami corporations would sell lots to Northerners to bring people down for $10 down and $10 a month. So this is post-World War II Florida at its best and how a lot of modern Florida was built. And, and it explains a lot, of mo a lot of modern Florida's problems today, which I'll get into. Now, let's go to Charlotte County here. Uh, there's Punta Gorda on Charlotte Harbor, and right across the way is Port Charlotte. There's a community now called Murdoch, and north of that is Northport. And you might read about these places in the news. Uh, Northport recently was the fastest growing community in Florida. Uh, Port Charlotte had been at times, um, and this entire region uh, is booming now. So this area right here was at one time one giant ranch. 
It was called the Frizzell Ranch. It looked like that. 78,000 acres, right? And A.C. Frizzell, uh, in the 1920s, he was a railroad telegrapher. He um, did the, 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 the telegraph poles. He, he, he tended the poles uh, on the way to Boca Grande, which was the deep water port to move phosphate off of the Peace River from Arcadia out to Boca Grande to be shipped out to, to generally to Europe. Um, and this land here had been essentially grubbed out by turpentine companies, uh, big companies would come in and clear the land for timber. And then once the timber was cut down, companies would come in and pull the stumps, uh, grind the stumps up for turpentine. And A.C. Frizzell bought this land at pennies on the dollar. Uh, he was self-made. He was a poor farm boy. And by the 1950s, he accumulated about 90,000 acres. He sold 78,000 acres of land uh, to a group of Miami investors, right? But but what are you going to do with this land? First of all, historically, this is what it looked like. This is what much of Southern and Central Florida looked like. It, this is hydric pine flatwoods, right? It was very difficult to farm here. Uh, you had to clear all the land, to burn all the land. Um, you had to burn it, um, uh, burn it down to create grassland for Florida's cattle land. And you had to continually burn it um, or pull the forest out to make it into farmland. Uh, and then during the winter, uh, this land would accumulate an, an incredible amount of water. Um, and and I, I wrote this in the book, and, and I know Craig Pittman has written this in his book. In Southwest Florida, and I believe this is probably the same in Southeast Florida, in, in Southwest Florida, it gets more rain in the rainy months, in the rainy season, which is May, June to August, September, uh, than Seattle gets an entire year, right? It's just torrential rain. And so in the summer, you have standing water all over Southwest Florida. Uh, and in the winter, it's bone dry and there's forest fires. So this was not a, a, a wildly inhabitable, easily inhabitable land uh, that could be used. And so this was the type of land that will, will be used for Florida's development. Now, A.C. Frizzell was not alone in selling this land in the 50s. You're going to see 25,000 other acres in Charlotte County that sold to the Vanderbilts to become Rotunda. 18,000 acres in 1952 that becomes Lehigh Acres in Lee County. That's the Lucky Lee Ranch. 1952, you're going to see 8,500 acres in St. Lucie, which is Port St. Lucie. That's Gardner Cowles, the, the publisher, millionaire, owner of Look, uh, Look Magazine. Look at this one, 294,000 acres in Collier, Lee, and Hendry County. That's going to be sold out and becoming Golden Gate Estates. 78,000 acres in Charlotte. That'll be Port Charlotte, Northport. And 12,000 acres in Hillsboro. That's going to be Sun City Center, right? And I'm going to explain why all this land is being sold, right? It's generally worthless farmland or grubbed out timberland. Uh, waterlogged cattle land um, that people are going to want to buy. Northerners are going to want to buy because things have changed. Now we have DDT. Now we have air condition. Uh, several million GI served in Florida during World War II, uh, and they wanted to go somewhere. They wanted to not return, like my father didn't want to return to East Pittsburgh, to the mills. He wanted to strike out on his own. So you have GIs that want to come to Florida. There's air condition. There's mosquito control. Uh, you're going to see the national uh, uh, the national interstate system um, come in. It's going to be easier to get to Florida. You're going to see pieces of I-95 finished, pieces of I-75 finished, and then all the different highways, 27, 17, 301. It's going to make it easier to get into Florida and to stay in Florida. And so who purchased this Frizzell Ranch? The Mackle brothers, those of you on the East Coast may know the Mackles. These are, are some of the most important people uh, in the history of modern Florida that, that people don't know. You know, we think of Plant, we think of Flagler, we think of Ed Ball, uh, we think of other uh, city builders. A lot of people don't know the Mackles. Uh, these were three brothers. Their father was an English immigrant, came over in the late 1800s, uh, and they grew up the sons of a builder 
who had done very well for himself in Atlanta, in Birmingham, uh, in Nashville. These were, uh, they were English Catholics, um, but in a way they had ingratiated themselves into the Southern Blue Blood Society. Their, their father told them, don't tell the Shriners were Catholics when they lived and went to private schools all over the South. Uh, their father had built tenements, uh, hotels, schools, big kind of utilitarian type buildings all over um, the modernizing South in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And these three brothers um, really enter the Southern elite. Uh, one brother, Frank Mackle Jr. went to Vanderbilt. The other two brothers went to Washington and Lee. Uh, and they knew like, like for those of you who are builders or know Florida building and its history, I, I know from living in Charlotte County, I had friends who were you know, very, very wealthy and then suddenly their parents would be you know, on the verge of bankruptcy, a, a, a recession would um, or, you know, deals would fall through. So, so the Mackles at various parts in their history are, are part of the country club set of Atlanta. Um, they even had a golf tournament, the Mackle Cup in Atlanta. Um, the mother had a um, perambulator parade for, for upper class women at the turn of the century. And then at various years, you, they disappear. They'd be living in a hotel in Pennsylvania for a couple of years until their father could rebound. So the Mackles uh, knew want but they also knew wealth and they were expected to be important men by their mother, by their, uh, and so once they graduated from college uh, in the 1930s, uh, one of the Mackles was uh, a builder in the military. He was a CB. Um, they came to Florida on their own, the three brothers and started building homes in Delray Beach on their own to see if they could do it. Uh, their father would give them a lot, give them a couple thousand bucks, and they would build a house, sell it, build another house, sell it. And pretty soon they got the business up and running. Uh, and then by the 1940s, late 1940s, they were among the biggest builders in Miami, uh, building uh, low cost, middle class suburbs, for example, Pompano Beach Highlands, small cinder block homes for the masses. Their father told them, don't build monuments to yourself build homes, build buildings that people can use. Uh, and that's what the Mackles did. Uh, that's uh, how they became famous. And so their most famous development early on was Key Biscayne. Uh, Key Biscayne today, uh, I haven't been there in many years, but I know lots there go for a million bucks, right? Uh, people are building, you know, very beautiful modernistic homes on, on Key Biscayne. But at one time, this was simply a middle-class suburb of Miami. Uh, when the Mackles built it, they were simple three-bedroom, two-bath, cinder block homes in a row, right? The idea was that you would wake up in the morning, kiss your wife goodbye, cross the Rickenbacker Causeway and go work, uh, you know, as a white-collar worker in Miami. This was essentially a Levittown. And so the Mackles got very good at, at turning, this had been a coconut plantation. They had taken, you know, an, an empty island, essentially, and turned it into a community, a freestanding community. No, there's no downtown, but they'd set aside a few lots for schools or some lot acreage here and there for churches. They would use that as a selling point. There'd be a country club. Uh, there'd be a little marina. But the idea was selling homes to the masses. And the Mackles uh, were essentially uh, of the same generation as, as the uh, Levitin sons, William Joseph Levitt. So let's think about this era, turning old Florida farmland, and, and in this case, an island on Key Biscayne, into uh, middle and, and working class homes and communities. This was the age of the suburb, right? The 1950s. People do not want to return to the cities after World War II. And I, I have some statistics here um, that between 1950 and 1960, our 20 largest cities grew one-tenth of one percent, right? In 10 years, our cities grew one-tenth of one percent, but our suburbs grew 45 percent, right? And, and I think back to my father in East Pittsburgh, family, immigrant family, working in the Westinghouse air break. My father would have cut off his arm rather than go back uh, to, to the mills. He just wouldn't do it. He had to get out. He had to use the GI Bill to go to college and then to get as far away from the mills as possible. And this was that generation. 
So this is Levittown, right? And, and people called these prefabricated. They weren't. What could be built off-site was, right, brought to the site. But the way they built this, they built these houses in teams, right? They would have a, a group that would uh, pour the foundation and they would pour 200 in a day. Then the framers would come, then the roofers would come, you know, on and on and on in groups and whatever could be brought on site would be brought on site. And then you would have, for example, um, you know, uh, kitchen cabinets that didn't have doors. Um, bathrooms would abut kitchen walls so they would share the pipes. Um, so you could build this house as quickly as possible. Cinder blocks were all the same size, so they didn't need to be cut. All the designs cut down on time to make it as economical as possible so you could sell this house as cheaply as possible. So this was happening all over the United States. You know, we, we think of Levittown as America's first great suburb. It wasn't. It was the one closest to New York that the newspapers could write about, that Life magazine could write about. The Mackles were doing the same thing in Florida. Row houses, limited offerings of wallpaper, carpet, you know, one of four designs, one of eight homes, that kind of thing. So now let's go back to the Brazil Ranch. How were the Mackles different, right? turning in a, a backwater area of Florida. It's close to the water. It's a few miles off of Charlotte Harbor, off the Gulf. But this isn't Miami Beach. This isn't the beaches of the East Coast or, or you know, clear water, the, these big, nice beaches. Uh, this is an area that's probably, uh, at the time in the 50s, 35 miles from the nearest hospital, right? There, there were no shopping malls yet in Florida. There were no pro teams in Florida yet. Uh, the highway didn't come down here. I-75 didn't even come down here well into the 1980s. So, you know, you're far down in Florida. So you're close to the water. And, and this is desirable land, but it's not the land that's going to get people excited, right? This isn't Coral Gables of the 20s. Who could live here, right? The Mackles know how to build. Uh, the Mackles know how to target working class Americans how to use installment plans, how to use bank plans, you know, how to, how, to, how to set it all up, but who can come here? And the Mackles realized that if we pitch it to middle income retirees, middle income retirees. Now in Levittown, back to, back to New York, in Levittown, the average homeowner uh, was expected to make about $5,500 a year. $5,500 a year in 1955, 1956. The average retired couple in 1955, 56 made $1,900 a year. So where were retirees going to go during the age of suburbanization? If you're a retiree and you work your whole life as a teacher or a policeman, you know, the middle income guys, you know, the, the working man, not, not, you know, not the wealthy banker, from a small town up north, but you know, the bus driver, the teacher, the cop, the fireman, how are you going to get out of these urban areas that are becoming more and more decrepit, right? When, when, when big cities in the north started to decline, how are you going to leave? Where are you going to go? You can't afford Levittown. Uh, you can't afford the other great suburbs, Monroeville and Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh. Um, where are you gonna go? And that's when the Mackles, come up with the idea, and this is where they're, they're wildly influential in the history of Florida, and they're going to create a revolution that, that's really important uh, and, and forms the basis of my book. They decide, well, why don't we sell them lots in Florida sight unseen? We can buy land, we can buy up these ranches, we can buy, for example, the Frizzell Ranch, 78,000 acres for 4 million bucks. Right, we can buy by the acre and sell by the foot, and then we can sell lots to these middle income retirees because they don't need to work. Once they come to Florida, they have their pensions, they have social security, they can live in these retirement communities that are in what the New York Times called kind of offbeat and hinterland sections of Florida, right? Port St. Lucie in 1960, Port Charlotte. Uh, Cape Coral, which was near Fort Myers in 1957, right? Not close to a downtown, not a suburb, just a freestanding community. So this is some of the early ads that the Mackles were pitching, $10 down and $10 a month for a choice of an 80 by 125 foot home site sale price, 
$895, right? Sight unseen. And at first, they tried it as a gimmick. They tried it in Pompano Beach. And then they tried it in Port Charlotte. And they received bushels full of cash. People would open Life magazine. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're up north. You're sitting with your husband and your wife watching TV or listening to the radio. And, and you see this ad and you want to go to Florida so much. This is so exciting to you that you would actually clip that out put a $10 bill or a check in an envelope and mail it to the Mackle Corporation. And they received bushels full of cash. They had to actually build an entire building onto their pre-existing building in Miami just to hire secretaries to file away all of this money, all of these lot reservations. And in exchange, you would send these retirees a map in a community they'd never been to, in a place in Florida they'd never seen, uh, a map with a with a, a gridded lots and their lot would be just chosen randomly and marked with an X, sight unseen. This is how this uh, installment land sales revolution began. And it's really not talked about in the history of modern Florida. It is a little bit, um, but it's fundamental to understanding the state. Uh, a, a lot of our uh, excerpts, those areas between the small towns and between the big cities in Florida. So this is one of the coupons. And, and so imagine, what, what does this tell you about Florida and the pull of the Florida dream post-World War II? I mean, this is pre-Disney. This is the Sunken Gardens, wiki watchy era of Florida. There's no Miami Dolphins, you know, that it's Miami Beach. It's the Don Cesar in, in St. Petersburg, right? Um, you know, this is early post-World War II Florida, and people are so excited that they're filling out coupons and buying land sight unseen. I, I just couldn't imagine doing that in my life. But these companies, uh, starting with the Mackles, begin to sell not just thousands of lots, but hundreds of thousands of lots. So this means you need more lots to sell. You need more money to develop the lots you've promised. And when you promise a lot, you're promising a home site. Very little development, but you're, you're, by law, you have to provide a paved road, some water drainage, so you're talking about a ditch, um, and they're going to have a septic tank. You're not going to have, there, there's no city water. This is county land, so a septic tank. Um, you will get Florida Power and Light to hook them up, and well water, you know, oftentimes sulfur water, because this is Florida. So, you know, not, not to me very desirable, but you have to think about the pull of the Florida dream and, and some of the push factors, right? You know, you've been, you've been driving a bus in Buffalo for 45 years, right? You want to get out. You, you, you want to have something to look forward to. And, and, and in a way, they're, they're helping to create, you know, this, this, this modern market, the, the, the modern sense that we're retirees and we have wants and desires in our golden years to fish, to be in the sun, to go to Florida even if we don't know where we're going, right? So they sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lots. This morphs soon enough from coupons in 1956, 57, 58. By 1960, this is far more sophisticated. You have thousands of salesmen all over the North and Northern cities um, who are, this one is leaving Battle Creek. This is a, um, Florida Ho tour of the General Development Corporation. That's the Mackles company based in Miami. Uh, they would have plane trips, bus trips that were subsidized and they bring you down to Florida and they kind of trap you on site. I, I'm the worst. When I, when I go to a, a, a lot, if I'm not with my wife to go buy a car, I pretty much buy the first car that I'm you know pressured into buying by a car salesman. So you imagine the type of salesmanship, high pressure salesmanship, on site, there's nowhere else to go in Port Charlotte or Port St. Lucie or Deltona in these days. You know, you're 20 and 30 miles away from any, any real community. Uh, the hotel that you stay in is generally owned by the company. Uh, they take you to a, you know, a nine hole championship golf course, uh, or they take you to, when I was growing up, we had the Port Charlotte Beach Club. It was on a muddy brown river. It wasn't much to look at, but that was a general development creation. You know, if, if you buy this lot, you will have full amenities at the beach club, you know, and they would push you and push you and push you. 
give you a good dinner, maybe a little bourbon. And, you know, you're a working class guy. You're, you're a woman who's been a teacher for 35 years. And this is, wow, right? This is, this is the, you know, the, the ticket to Florida. And they sold lots. Then they start using uh, win a week in Florida contests, um, sponsoring radio shows, sponsoring television shows, infomercials, some of the first infomercials in the United States. Remember when, for those of you who are, you know, I'm 49, I remember this. Remember when TV would end at one o'clock at night and they play the national anthem and your local television would just go off air? Well, they would run a commercial for Cape Coral, Florida. Beautiful Cape Coral, call now. Um, and then out of Miami, they set up some of the first Watts lines in the United States, the first essentially 1 800 numbers. Um, and by, I'd say, 1970, they were making 6 million calls a year. Uh, you know, just picking names out of the phone book, sales dinners, picking names out of the phone book, um, picking communities out of the phone book. Um, and they're not calling, you know, Gross Point, Michigan. They're not calling elite communities, Shaker Heights, Ohio. They're calling, you know, these working class white flight areas of northern cities to get you to come to Florida. This is one of my favorites. This was in Life magazine. This is a Port Charlotte booth in a terminal and a train station in Boston, uh, that's Philadelphia, I've seen Boston for that same picture. Um, so you come off the train, you're tired, you've worked all day, you know, you, you're, you're going to Long Island or you're going to, you know, suburban Philadelphia, you get, you're gonna get on the train, you see these girls with bathing suits on and they're telling you how wonderful Port Charlotte is. And so they're selling lots, selling lots on installment plans like chewing gum in kiosks, you could buy lots in 1960 in Northern cities. It was that easy. They also sold lots to GIs abroad, um, tourists abroad. Um, <laughs> you, you, could, you would take it, first of all, GIs, this is, this is from um, Stars and Stripes, um, did a whole expose as did the St. Petersburg Times, um, that GIs would be in Vietnam or Thailand and they'd be, uh, brought into a bar and a pretty girl would be told, hey, GI, come here, right? You think she's a prostitute. She takes you to another room and it's a buffet of food and drinks and it's a sales pitch to buy land in Florida. <laughs> and, and you can see why after retirees, uh, GIs are going to have a pension. They're gonna have a fixed income and they're going to be thinking ahead to retirement. Uh, they're going to get monthly payments. They're going to be able to pay the $10 down or the $15 down a month uh, in Florida, and plus GIs aren't going to have state income tax. Um, and so these companies now have worldwide sales networks. And so what the Mackles started, I would say in 1956, by 1960, by 1960, was a billion dollar a year industry. This was like, uh, you know, Silicon Valley almost coming out of nowhere. And it, it's going to rise and fall. It's going to come and go from about 56 to 76, I would say. 55 to 75, this industry appears, it, it chops up huge stretches of Florida, probably, I'm guessing a million acres into several million 80 by 125 foot quarter acre lots, uh, canal front lots, they're gonna chop canals through communities, Cape Coral, for example, um, and then they're just gonna disappear. Um, you know, they bought up most of the land um, inflation hits. There's all these reasons that the model collapses. Um, but at one time, this, this installment land sales industry was, was a, a Wall Street darling. These companies were, were coming out of nowhere, were listed on Wall Street. By the mid-1960s, there were 234 companies selling 50 lots or more on installment plans. 50 lots or more, right? Then there were others that were unregistered selling 49 lots or less. Now, registering, the reason you register is because many of these land dealers, some of these land giants as well, not really the Mackles, um, but you know, using high pressure salesmanship, um, you're going to have salesmen who lie, right? You know, Toyota is a good company. I'm sure there's been salesmen who have, you know, you know pushed the envelope before. Um, they all did it. They all did it. 
Um, and some were out and out felonious. Um, the Gulf American Corporation had thousands of charges against it. And then there were some that simply sold land that didn't exist, right? These were called 49ers selling land, not just on the edge of the Everglades, like Golden Gate Estates, um, uh, you know, but selling places in, you know, in Monroe County in the Everglades that you would never build on in a million years. Um, some of the biggest ones are on this map, the Deltona Corporation, uh, that's a Mackle company. They leave the General Development Corporation, GDC, ITT development. ITT um, is a Levitt Connected Corporation, Del Webb, uh, Kavanaugh Communities, actually built in Palm Beach counties before it became Kavanaugh. Um, Gulf American is Cape Coral, uh, Golden Gate Estates, River Ranch, some others. But these were known as land giants. And I would say uh, the most fascinating of the Wheeler Dealer land giants to me were the Rosen brothers. They owned the Gulf American Corporation. Um, they were a perfect foil to the Mackles. I, I, I wish I was a, I, I were a screenwriter. I would write a, a, a movie uh, or, a, or a, a series called The Swamp Peddlers, and I'd have the blue blooded kind of upright Mackle community leader brothers versus the Rosens. And this is the way it played out. The Rosens, um, were, were two tough Jewish kids from the streets of Baltimore, self-made brawlers. Uh, they were carnival barkers as kids in the 20s, you know, step right up, probably pickpockets. I don't know. I mean, th these were interesting, tough men, self-made men who began selling um, televisions, um, other type of, of appliances from a store in Baltimore on installments. Remember layaway? These guys did layaway. Um, and they got good at it, and they parlayed that into shampoo. They sold formula number nine with coupons in magazines. Uh, some of you may remember that. Uh, this was simply hotel shampoo mixed in a bathtub with lanolin. And they said that it you know, did all these amazing things for your hair. And they had these really high intensity sales pitches in magazines and radio channels all over America. And they made several million dollars by their 30s. Um, these were wealthy, tough men um, who had really got their hands dirty. They had sales networks uh, selling all over the North. And it really occurred to them, why are we selling shampoo at a dollar a bottle uh, when we could be selling Florida lots at $895 a lot? They didn't know how to build. They didn't know anything about home building. They didn't know anything about community building, unlike the Mackles who had done it, uh, whose father had done it. And so they came to Florida and found a, a, a low-lying bit of land across the Caloosahatchee from Fort Myers, uh, which they bought up and called, they optioned, bought up for very little money down uh, and called it Cape Coral. Uh, now Cape Coral is bigger than Fort Lauderdale. Cape Coral is one of the top 10 largest cities in Florida, has well over 200,000 people. It will probably have six or seven or 800,000 by 2050 uh, and is bigger geographically than Boston and San Francisco combined. Uh, and so the Rosens were the ones who, unlike the Mackles, really pushed the envelope. Uh, they're going to start selling people not just home sites, but raw acreage, Golden Gate Estates, places that you really can't live, uh, River Ranch, and they're going to get the whole industry in trouble. Fascinating wheeler dealers. Now, what was the problem with this community building? When I, when I set out to write this book, I expected to write a book kind of like Glengarry Glen Ross. I wanted to write funny stories about salesmen, unscrupulous salesmen, uh, ripping off gullible Yankees, right? I, I thought that would be a funny, interesting story. Uh, what I found was a lot more profound. It wasn't just people coming down and, and putting their money down on land in the middle of nowhere uh, in hog country or rattlesnake country, uh, but a history of failed development. Um, these, the Mackle brothers who were conscientious developers, I would say failed in some ways to build correctly. Uh, the Rosens failed utterly. Some of these developers didn't care at all. And so this is what it turned into a book about unintended consequences, kind of the sins of the grandfathers visited on the grandsons and the granddaughters of Florida today. Now, this is a quote from Paul Reyes. He wrote a book on the property meltdown in the 2000s. He was writing about Lehigh Acres in the 50s. 
The idea from the beginning was to sell lots, nothing more. No forethought was given to the possibility that someone might actually want to live there. No consideration given to streets or schools or sewers. Selling, not building, was how these developers measured their success. Now, now why? Why did lot sales become bigger than home sales? Right Now, at first, the Mackles thought they would get these people hooked on lots. They would wait a few years, make their payments, sell their house, and move to Florida. But moving to Florida, many of you who aren't from Florida, it, it's not easy. Right. Even in this modern age, you know, you've got to move your home. You've got to leave everything, you know, you've got to leave your children. You've got to leave everything you've had in the past and move to a new community. And especially in 1956, that's hard to do. Right. Sometimes they just loaded up a car and sold all their furniture and only brought clothes. Right. So they found out that in Port Charlotte, they have 200,000 lots staked out. People are buying the lots, but they're not building the homes. Cape Coral. Port St. Lucie, Deltona, you have a lot of lots, cleared land and roads to nowhere, uh, but, but very few homes. Homes are slowly filling out. Even today, you can drive around Port St. Lucie or Palm Coast or Cape Coral and find empty land from the 1950s. Here's another one. This was what one of the developers of Lehigh Acres said. We gave so much thought to selling the land that the normal reservations for commercial properties, schools, all the ancillary things you need in a community weren't made. We even had canals that ran uphill. These guys often didn't know what they were doing. Here's another one. Port Charlotte started out as a land sales project. Then poor community develop, development initiated to generate new sales snowballed the site into a city. It's too bad we can't go back, right? a land sales project, not a community, but a land sales project. This is my favorite. This is Leonard Rosen. He was looking at Cape Coral as they're, they're staking it out and building it. And he's had a long day and his car got stuck and he unloosens his tie and he looks out and he goes, you know, I think we're gonna build a city in spite of ourselves. There's actually a book by one of his secretaries, she self-published in the eighties, and it's called the history of Cape Coral, Florida. It's called lies that came true. Lies that came true, right? So once lot sales make so much money, they all become addicted to it. They all become addicted to the quick bucks. And so does Wall Street selling these lots. This was what Cape Coral was in 1955. And this is what Cape Coral quickly began, became. Now it's 120,000 lots staked out as far as the eye can see. It's one of Florida's great booming communities today uh, with no end in sight. It's massive and it's going to be massive. Bigger than Boston and San Francisco combined. Also, uh, and we'll talk about in a second, the, the Rosens knew that waterfront property was more valuable than inland property. So they simply dredged and filled. There were no rules. You could do whatever you wanted in those days. They built over 400 miles of canals. Cape Coral today, I believe as far, I mean, I, I've tried to check, uh, they say has more canals than any other city in the world, right? And, and, and those canals are devastating environmentally uh, as are Fort Lauderdale's canals. Canals are tough, canals are tough. And I'll explain that in a second. Now, what were some of the problems of these communities? Um, now, first of all, I wanna say that Port Charlotte's and, and Port St. Lucie's and Cape Corals, these allowed generations of Northerners to move to Florida cheaply to find new lives. So I'm not criticizing that, right? Everyone I, I believe has the right or has had the right to enjoy the Florida dream. Um, but when you're selling these poorly planned lots and people begin to build, you're gonna see some environmental problems. Now, those of you who know Florida, if you see right there, in the foreground, what is that right there? That lump in the front of this little cinder block house. That's a septic tank, right? That's a septic tank. And today, Lehigh Acres has 22,000 septic tanks. 22,000 septic tanks. It has over 100,000 citizens. It still has homes that are not connected to the water grid, right? And oftentimes you would have row after row after row of houses in a straight grid pattern you know, like a football field grid in the front, you have the septic tank, and in the back, you have a waterway, right? 
25,000 times, built in the 1950s, built poorly with no inspection standards, no law to inspect today. And this is a very common scene in Lehigh Acres when you have big rains in the rainy season. And so what happens when the septic tank is covered in water along with, <laughs> along with your water well, right? Sometimes you have leaks and sometimes sewage gets into the water table and on occasion, you'll see sewage getting into people's drinking water, right? You see some, some third world diseases popping up in Florida in these old, poorly planned, poorly built communities. Traffic. This is Charlotte County. This is Port Charlotte looking um, from essentially Northport, looking out to the Peace River and Charlotte Harbor, Panagorda's across the bridge. Um, they had no downtowns. Why do these communities not have a downtown? Why is there no downtown in Cape Coral? Why is there no downtown in Deltona? No downtown in Port St. Lucie? It's because why, right? You're selling lots. You're selling as many lots as quickly as possible. You might leave a little land for some future district, but the way the town develops is a commercial corridor. Tamiami Trail, so Port Charlotte's downtown, if you can call it that, is essentially you know, a three or four lane Tamiami Trail, US 41 for seven miles, right? So you have, you know, horrific histories of traffic. It's, it's just impossible to drive through there. Um, and, and, and cities with no sidewalks, uh, bus services are impossible because even if you do provide a bus, how are you gonna get to it? You live seven miles, six miles away from the main thoroughfare. How, you know, th there's no there there. Um, I, I'm not the first to write that. Many people write that. Where would the bus go to and where would it stop and where, where is your central core? Um, and so many of these cities are trying desperately to create central cores. I, I would say all of these cities are trying to come up with ways to recreate downtowns, right? Also, these communities. Um, uh, this is Northport, Florida from 2020. I took this from Google Earth. This is right near I-75 looking east, right? Those are lots that were built in the 1950s that never, that never were built on, right? You just can't build out there. You can't get utilities. You can't, you know, who knows a chicken or the egg, but these are lots and, and streets that have existed for 60 years. Uh, when I was in high school, we would have parties out here. <laughs> bonfires. You would go out here to fist fight or make out with your girlfriend or people would throw trash out here. Um, and also, I thought this was an urgent urban legend, but, but um, drug dealers would fly in Cessnas and land on these empty streets. And, and to me, this is really one of the origins of the book. This was kind of like a Mad Max kind of post-apocalyptic scene when I was a kid, when you drive away from the outer core of Port Charlotte or Northport. Uh, or Cape Coral, you would hit streets with maybe one house every six or seven blocks, maybe, not even. Here, there are no houses in 2020. This is a, a street scene I took not long ago from Lehigh Acres. So how do you provide police services, ambulance services, trash pickup, right? And these counties do, right? This is, you know, uh, uh, these counties didn't have any building codes in those days. You could build willy-nilly, um, you know, avoiding taxes by not incorporating. They, they never wanted to incorporate generally. Uh, or if they did incorporate, it was to be controlled by the company. Uh, Northport was a, um, a, a, a company town, as was Port St. Lucie at one time. Then many counties abandoned the streets. Um, and this is a, a, a recent seen from Port Charlotte, I took off a flicker, Western Port Charlotte, probably 15,000 lots. The county said, we're not paying for the roads here because we're never gonna build here. So this is what you see. This is what I meant about these post-apocalyptic scenes in these communities. But the rest of the, the communities are thriving, right? This is where the, a lot of the future of Florida is because there are developable lots. Uh, now, I'm almost done. Now, um, <laughs> going back to the, uh, uh, the, the drug deals. I, I looked this up. I couldn't believe it. Uh, this was utterly and completely true that, that planes would, would plow into, <laughs> sometimes they would hit 
telephone wires, if there were any. Sometimes it hit treetops and land. Other times um, they would land, a truck would pull up, um, load up with the drugs and then take them away. And oftentimes these communities, um, Palm Bay or Cape Coral or Golden Gate Estates, this is how a lot of the drugs got to the East Coast of Florida, got to Miami. They would land in places with few policemen with thousands of miles of empty roads load up and then use Alligator Alley or Tamiami Trail to take the drugs into um, Southeast Florida. And this one is one of my favorite. This plane landed in Rotunda, uh, which is in Charlotte County and crashed. Deputies and customs agents continued to circle on foot and in vehicles looking for a man who was described as looking like Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> I, it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in, in a newspaper. Here's another one from Golden Gate Estates. 175 million in cocaine confiscated. This is right near Alligator Alley, right near Alligator Alley. So you can imagine 175 million. Uh, that was in the 80s. I, I don't know what that is today, 400 zillion billion. That's a lot of money. Uh, that's gotta be one of the largest hauls ever in Florida. And that was just one flight into Golden Gate Estates. Cape Coral, I saw this. We figure as much as 90% of all marijuana smuggled into the United States comes here from Colombia. And we figure as much as 80% of that 90% is touching American soil somewhere along the Southwest Florida coastline. I know of no better place to land a plane than in the Northwestern section of Cape Coral, right? This is from 1979. And so these empty streets, um, not only were, were, were bad environmentally, you know, cutting, cutting down, bad for drainage, bad for, you know, in, in many ways. Uh, but they were also inviting crime. Um, for those of you who know, Palm Bay. Palm Bay still has a region called the Compound. I, I spoke with the mayor of Palm Bay. I, I don't know who's the mayor now, a couple of years back. And I said, what's the origin of the name, the Compound? And, and the mayor didn't know. Um, but this is a part of Palm Bay that Palm Bay has simply said, you can't develop here. Even if you own a lot, you're not allowed to develop, it's too far out. We can't bring you water, we can't bring you services. And so it's just a kind of a, a, a wild zone of Palm Bay where people race cars and dump mattresses. And but, but think about this, these were supposed to be lots for single family homes for retirees in 1958. And this is <laughs> what's left. Now, where did the swamp peddling come in? And, and this is the last part. When you sold a lot in uh, on installment plans, you had to provide a road within, you know, the six or seven or eight years that people paid. Then you had to provide a ditch. You had to bring the lot high enough up so it didn't flood and it could have a septic tank. So, you know, five and a half, six, seven feet up. Um, and that's why you see those two bedroom, the three bedroom, two bath houses that are a little bit higher up with the ditch in front, with the driveway in front. That was a typical way of building. Uh, now the Rosens of Cape Coral decided why do we even give them that? Why do we have to, even though we made a lot of money, the Rosens, uh, at one time, the Gulf American Corporation was the largest company in Florida. It had 5,000 employees. Uh, the Rosens were in the hunt for the AFL team that became the Miami Dolphins. Uh, and the Rosens had one of the, the, the greatest art galleries in Florida. They owned the Gulf American Gallery of Miami where they would put their Van Goghs and the Renoirs up on the wall. And then when people would come to see the art, they would then give them a sales pitch to buy land in Cape Coral. This is what they did. Um, and so the Rosens realized that if we promise people a home site, we have to deliver in seven or eight years. And if prices go up, if inflation hits, you know, we're on the hook for at one point, a hundred million dollars. And so Leonard Rosen told his brother, well, why don't we just sell raw land? Why don't we just choose the cheapest land we could find in a swamp, in the Everglades, Golden Gate Estates, or in the Green Swamp, right, uh, the, the, the lower part of the Kissimmee region? Uh, why don't we sell them land and promise nothing, promise nothing, uh, $200, $300 for an acre or two and a half acres that we've purchased for $25, but we let our salesmen say whatever they want. Right? We put nothing in print, you know, we do everything above board, but when they're sold the land, they're going to be lied to. And we push and push and push, and they did this. So they sold 
a uh, hundred and something thousand lots in Golden Gate Estates. Half of those lots were never, ever, ever going to be built on. Uh, and in River Ranch, which today those lots cannot be built on. So this is where the intense swamp peddling came in and where the government got involved, where the state got involved and where the Rosens almost went to prison and other Wheeler dealers did go to prison. This is uh, one of their ads, but it, essentially it says, um, at the bottom it says, it is being offered with no improvement claims as raw unimproved acreage, right? Nothing promised at all, but thousands of Northerners, thousands of mom and pops bought this land actually thinking they could build there, right? So you go from home site sales, the $10 down, $10 a month, to raw acreage sales, and that's where you really get the swamp peddling in Florida. Golden Gate Estates, Golden Gate Estates. And finally, uh, in the last, I would say, 30 years, uh, there's been moves by the state of Florida and private groups to return some of these failed communities. They call them ghost subdivisions. Um, Cape Coral worked, Port Charlotte worked, you know, for all their problems, they all became functioning communities. Palm Bay, Deltona, Palm Coast, um, you know, a couple million Floridians live there today, but a number of developments in Polk County, uh, which is Lakeland, um, east of Daytona and Volusia County, uh, and especially in Collier, failed miserably. You know, hundreds of thousands of buyers uh, were essentially lied to and scammed. Uh, they could not build on these lots. And so this is a Google Earth view of the southern part of Golden Gate Estates. You can still see the boulevards from Google Earth. Those were boulevards that were cut out of the Everglades. They built canals and weirs and dams and dikes and essentially destroyed the Western Everglades. This is apocalyptic for, for you environmental folks um, to build home sites, knowing that these home sites were never going to be built on. And so in the 1980s and early 1990s, a lot of wealthy Collier County residents, Naples residents, the state of Florida, um, uh, environmental groups all over the world began trying to buy this land back. Um, they've done that in, in, in Polk County. They've done that in Volusia. Uh, Volusia County even buys lots back to make sure this will never happen again. And so this has become the Picayune Strand State Forest today. I have a friend who actually lives in Boca and her job is to figure out a way to take all the dikes and dams out um, over time to restore the Everglades into a river of grass, a, a, a sheet of grass, right? Uh, and so this is what you will find today in the Southern Golden Gate Estates, south of Alligator Alley. And lastly, and this is the funniest thing, at one point in the 1980s in Golden Gate Estates, they found a, sand, a Contra training camp in Golden Gate Estates. They were using these lots that had been sold to Northerners, had been ripped off, to train for civil war in, in Central America, right? So this is just that these places were crazy uh, at one time. And uh, I thought that I'd share that with you. That was kind of funny. So this is the, the communities I've talked about in this book. And, and I'll answer really any questions of, uh, that you may have. Um, you know, sorry if this is a little bit disjointed. It's a lot of information. But this is how a lot of modern Florida was built. And as you can see, these are some of our are, are big communities and where a lot of Florida's growth is going to be moving forward because these communities still have lots, lots to build on, buildable land. So thank you.